component that is already created, that was created manually by an inventive user, it's actually the stator component of uh, this um, electrical engine. So as you can see, the component is already fully created. Uh, all dimensions have been added. Um, in fact, in this component, the geometry you see here is even uh, too much uh, geometry compared to what we would uh, strictly need if we focused only on the functional geometry. I'm going to here to select the functional geometry just to give an idea about what would be strictly uh, needed. So we will need those two faces, we will need this circle arc here because it centers the upper cover as I will show later. We will need the inner faces of the rotor because uh, that's where we want to analyze the gaps between the rotor and the stator. We will need those inner faces as well and we would only need then the clipping faces here of the bottom cover. So the geometry highlighted in green is really what we'd, we would only need. Um, this functional geometry is um, something that can be created manually very quickly in, uh, in Inventive. Creating such a geometry and associating all dimensions, all tolerances and all process capabilities can be done in, in a matter of only a few minutes. I'm going to show a second component now um, which actually is not yet created in Inventive and I'm going to show how it's possible to um, create the functional modeling of this component based on uh, geometry coming from the CAD system. So I'm going to import this geometry using uh, an IGS import and I'm going to consider that uh, an IGS uh, export has already been made from the CAD system. This IGS information concerns the rotor component so I'm just going to import it here in the sketch. As you can see we are getting all the geometry that was present in the CAD model. Uh, right now we have 68 degrees of freedom in the sketch. It's important to note that um, the inventive internal architecture is based on MAT. Um, it's a very different architecture than the CAD arch architecture. Uh, this is why inventive is so powerful. It only means that uh, as for a user, a user who imports geometry uh, needs to uh, recreate automatically all the constraints and dimensions that are necessary to do the functional drawing of this component. Here it means I'm going to create automatically the constraining of this rotor component. I'm going to say constraining should be based on this reference. Then it should be based also on the vertical axis here as a second reference. And then when we have defined this referencing system, A and B, we can ask the auto-constrainer to recreate automatically all the constraining associated to this uh, component. Uh, the two references here have been dimensioned. Uh, secondly, we create all the connectivities in, in this component. Then we create diameters. We don't have diameters here. Position constraints, radial dimensions, we don't have. Point to line dimensions, we don't have. Orientation constraints, we have quite a few. Um, in fact, we need, when we do that, we need to reverse the uh, direction of some of the dimensions. Okay, this one, this one, this one. Uh, then the two that we have at the top. Okay. Um, Next step, we are going to create angular dimensions. We don't have any uh, point to line dimensions. We have a few in the model. Okay. And uh, in this model now, we are left with one degree of freedom. So this degree of freedom is uh, the measurement of the uh, radius here on, the, on this side. I'm just going to say that this radius should be equal to this dimension. So when this is done, you can see we end up with a component that has uh, zero degree of freedom, as it is advised in, in an inventive model. Um, so this component can be used now in an assembly. Um, the constraining I was just showing here is just an example of constraining. 
uh, this constraining um, was done here fully um, in a fully automated way. Of course, it's possible to use a semi-automated way uh, by using the auto constrainer and also by um, interacting manually between uh, each step of the uh, auto constraining. I'm just going now to save this component as a component we will call uh, rotor and we will use it later in our assembly. In this new inventive file I'm going to say that I want to load first the stator component. Of course this component is not locked, it has 3 degrees of freedom, so I'm going to associate a fixed point and a fixed angle. Second step, I will hide here the axis that I don't need and which may make the model a little bit too complicated. Um, then I will say I have to load the, the upper cover and the lower cover of the system. Um, so I'm going to load this component, which is the upper cover. We can say that uh, this component is uh, mounted on the stator based on two clips, the two red clips that we have here. So we are going to say this point should be on this face, this point should be on this face, and then to center the um, upper cover, we are going to say that uh, the center point of the black circle should be on this uh, vertical axis. Next step, we are going to load the bottom cover, this component, okay, so I'm going to say this component uh, is going to be clipped as well with the uh, stator, so this point goes on this face, this point goes on this face, and then we are going to say that this point has to go on this axis. So now we can load the rotor component on this assembly. So we simply say we load the rotor component that we created and constrained uh, just before. And we mount it uh, using uh, point on object constraints again. Um, the bearings can be modeled in many different ways in Inventive. Uh, it depends if we want to represent the actual uh, ball bearing or not. Uh, it, we want, it depends if we want to represent the float as well. Here I'm going to consider I want to represent a contact, so I'm going to say this point should be on this side of the upper bearing, this point should also be on this side of the lower bearing, and then in tr translation the rotor is going to be in contact with the green face that is here, so I'm going to say this point should be on this face. So we have finished this simple constraining of uh, the different components of the assembly. Now we can switch to uh, building the stacks, all the gaps that we need to analyze in this uh, mechanical assembly. Very often, um, some key parameters are the distance between the rotor and the stator at different locations. So we can quickly create many measurements at many places in the model using simply dimensions between corners of the rotor and, co and lines of the stator or here between this corner and this line this corner and this line this corner and this line and again here so I have created here uh, eight um, dimensions, eight stacks that we will, we will then be able to analyze we can call it for example uh, J, G1 and uh, we are just going to do a stack on it. So we select it and we say Analyze Tolerance. So it generates in Excel uh, a stack that shows the variation. So uh, we see in minus 6 sigma we have a, a gap that will be 0 0.79 and at plus 6 sigma we have a gap that will be 2.75. And we have all the dimensions in the different components that have an impact on this stack. So the most important ones that we will need to check very accurately um, and the lower important ones on which it's possible to quickly try to uh, increase the tolerance range to uh, save um, cost and uh, without, uh, without putting the, the quality in, in question. 
So on this tag, we could say, for example, for electromagnetic reasons, um, we would like to have uh, the dimension always to be between one millimeter and two millimeters, for example. So we could say we enter those limits. Lower limit is one, upper limit is two. And then we can say analyze tolerance. So it gives uh, now a stack that evaluates the number of cases in uh, one million in which we will have some uh, um, gap measurements that will be outside of the limits one and two. So we see the this is represented by the, the area between the be on the right of the red line and below the blue uh, distribution. So it represents 81,000 cases in one million in which the gap would be um, out of spec. So now it's possible as well to uh, realize uh, statistical analysis on all the gaps uh, in one step. So we can say, okay, all those gaps, you can see that uh, when we select them one after each other, they appear here in the list of variables on the right. So we can rename them. Uh, we can call this one, for example, G2, uh, this one G3. So they can be renamed according to the uh, specific naming conventions for um, design outputs within uh, an R&D area. And then we can select all of them directly from this list. So they get all selected as well in the sketch. And we can say analysis, analyze tolerance. So when we do that, um, the benefit is that we get uh, a tolerance analysis that is done now in a, in a matrix form. So we have all the gaps uh, in each uh, different column. Uh, for all of them, we have the plus and minus three sigma variations. So we can see the ones who are going to be outside of the limit between uh, one and two. Uh, then we have the worst case variations. Those variations are relative. And then we have the list of contributors. So we know um, what are going to be the contributors which have the biggest average contribution on all stacks. Here we know uh, this dimension here, uh, the radius of the rotor is the one that has the biggest uh, impact on uh, all the stacks that we are analyzing at the moment. So it's also possible to um, uh, change the limits of tolerances on all the stacks in one step. So here I did not define the limits on all of them, but we can define for all of them lower limit to be uh, one, and upper limit to be two. Okay, and then redo the stacks analysis okay so it allows to have those limits taken into account in the uh, analysis then in this report as well um, the good thing is that the report can be used not only to find out which are the dimensions that are the most important for all the mechanism but also it can be used to find out uh, all what are all the impacts in the mechanism. So here, for example, I have displayed the report in uh, a way that uh, actually displays uh, not the contributions, but the sensitivity values. So you can see, for example, um, dimension here, uh, LDIM3, which is, uh, we can see here the, the this dimension on the rotor, it has uh, an impact of uh, plus one on uh, gap six and plus one as well on gap, gap eight. So gap six and gap eight being the, the axial gaps between the rotor and the stator. So if we take another dimension, <coughs> let's take for example uh, a radial dimension, so let's go on uh, Yeah, 
let's go on this dimension for example we see <coughs> it's a dimension of the upper cover it's a distance between the red axis on the upper cover and the main axis of the upper cover it's 38 in nominal value uh, we can see here all its uh, impact we can see which are the dimensions that will be impacted uh, positively and which are the ones with which are going to be impacted uh, negatively. So, for example, if we look at uh, the two gaps that are on the side here, this one is um, this one is the left gap. It has a nominal value of uh, 1.42. It's G3, and this one is uh, G1. It has a value of uh, 1.77. Uh, so we see that the right gap is a little bit too big. It is 1.77, whereas it should be 1.5. And the left gap is a little bit uh, too low. It is 1.42, where it should be uh, 1. Uh, 1.5 as well. So it's possible to use this uh, matrix uh, report to look at uh, G1 and uh, G3. So G1 is here in this column. G3 is in this column. So if we look at the dimension, we see it impacts uh, G3 uh, by a sensitivity of uh, minus 0 0.55 and G1 with a sensitivity of 0 0.55. So it means by changing the value uh, of this dimension, we should be able to lower the nominal value of G1 and, and increase the nominal value of G3. So normally, if we increase the value, this should give the the sorry if we decrease the value this should be should give the right result so we we can put this value for example at uh, uh, 37.95 so we see this change is increasing a little bit the nominal value of g3 and reducing a little bit the nominal value of g1 so i'm reducing to 37.9 it's increasing again um, reducing to 37.85 okay so now we are having G3 that is uh, coming now uh, above 1.5 and G1 that is uh, reduced to 1.68 so if I reduce to 37.8 um, we have uh, one of the two gaps which is at uh, 1.54 and the other one which is at uh, 1.66 so this matrix can be used to uh, make this type of uh, changes and analysis of changes uh, in models where there are uh, a lot of um, stacks that need to be optimized um, uh, at the same time. So of course the, optim the little optimization I did, I did here was only uh, relative to the nominal values but it's possible to also uh, make changes to uh, nominal values here and check the impact of those changes on the uh, va variation limits on the different gaps. It's also possible to change tolerance values on the different dimensions here and to check the impact on the, on the variation limits on the different gaps.